In Greek, one of the words for beauty, kalon, means both the beautiful and the good. It is the word used in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, where we read that when God saw that what he had created was good. So goodness and beauty are sisters. Beauty is not just to be admired, it's to be imitated so that he or she who contemplates it becomes good themselves. True artistic beauty helps transform the viewer into a better and more loving being. True beauty, therefore, is ascetic as well as aesthetic. It calls and trains us for change, for repentance. The word ascetic means to train. But what is repentance? In the Greek, the word is metania. Meta means to change, and noia is from the word moose. Noose is often translated into English as mind, but this is too shallow a word. I think all those who meditate realize that the heart and the mind are, are distinct. St. Ephraim the Syrian, a fourth century monk of the desert, and one of the greatest poets of the church, described the noose as the eye of the heart. So repentance is above all, I think, a change in the way we see things. And change of action comes from this change of seeing. If I see another human as separate from me, and not as my own flesh and blood, a brother or a sister of my own nature, then I can more readily treat him or her with depth respect. But if I see them, on the other hand, as they really are, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, of the same human nature as myself, then I love him or her as myself. I used to think the command to love your neighbor as yourself was a quantitative one, to love them as much as yourself, but my brother and my sister are part of me. So I will see their sufferings as my own sufferings, their joys as mine, because we share the same human nature. I will even tremble in the sight of such a creature, a wonderful being created by the King of Kings, a prince or princess of the Most High, made in his image, a created God. But can we see everyone in this way? Surely there are many boorish, unpleasant, unkind, and even evil people in the world. They certainly are. But they're still created by God and are made in his image. What they have allowed themselves to become is a distortion of their true nature. The bad does not have independent existence. It can only be a parasite on the good. Beneath the unattractive and even the repulsive is a masterpiece waiting to be restored. I say restored, but we're called to go even beyond the simple restoration of what we lost in paradise. We are called to be more than just glorious humans. We are called to be gods by grace, to be saints, the early fathers of the church have told us. So our proper destiny is not just to be a glorious tree in paradise, but a tree burning with the spirit of God. I now go on to screen share to share with you some icons. This is an icon of Moses before the burning bush. So we're called by grace to be saints, to be like a bush burning with God's presence within us. But when the second, second person of the Trinity, the word of God became flesh, he did so not for the sake of us, like some pitiful worm, some wretched and despicable creatures, but because we are princes and princesses of his kingdom whom he wanted to restore to their glory. God became flesh to give us the throne and the kingdom that his father had prepared for us. He came to give us the Holy Spirit. So Christ wrapped himself in our humanity so that he could transfigure it with his light. He came not just to restore our lost dignity, our royal garment, but to give us the very Holy Spirit. Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. You know him, for he lives with you 
and will be in you. So I'm a maker of icons, and my task is to paint people in a cosmos restored to this divine beauty. But the icon is not just to be looked at. As shocking as it might seem to some Protestants, Orthodox Christians actually kiss icons. This is not because we are worshipping the icon, of course, but we want to greet and honour our brothers and sisters and Christ and the angels depicted on these icons. We honour those who have run the good race and fought the good fight. We greet those who, are, who have arrived back home in paradise, who have been granted the Holy Spirit and are shining with his light. These saints give us hope for the restoration of all that is good and beautiful. They give us hope that good can triumph over bad, that the light of divine beauty can cast out the ugliness of evil. An 8th century saint, John of Damascus, wrote that, I worship God alone, but I will not cease to venerate the matter through which my salvation was effected. He's writing here of icons in particular, but he's talking about the whole of the material world which Christ took upon himself when he became incarnate. So when he wrote of venerating matter, he was speaking not just of painted icons, but of the whole material world created by God and with which God was pleased to unite himself when he became flesh. Creation is, I believe, a song of love from its maker to his creatures. Icons depict mountains, rivers, trees, animals as what they are, a love letter from the bridegroom wooing us to himself. Death is not annihilation, it's separation. The story told in the book of Genesis of mankind's fall in paradise is at heart the story of all of us grabbing the gift and turning our back on the giver. It's the story of, a, of turning a gift into a mere object. And I think our ecological crisis is the natural result of man treating the world as if it were a bank full of money rather than an expression of God's love to us. I think this is why the central act of the Christian faith is thanksgiving, that is the Eucharist, which means to give thanks. For by thanksgiving, we see that beauty has a face. It is a card on which is written from God with love. So the beauty of creation is a call to draw nearer to the giver, the creator of that beauty. I've had the blessing of meeting some saints, even getting to know some of them quite well. And what struck me most about them is how different each one of them is. And this taught me that holiness brings out the uniqueness of each person. Each saint I found to be like a jewel with his or her own unique color, as it were. The Bible ends with a description of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, the interesting thing is that the foundations of this wall are adorned with every jewel, 12 of them, each differently colored. Each person is in fact a potential saint, as it were a rough stone waiting to be polished into a bright and clear jewel. So repentance and holiness reveals each person's unique beauty it does, make, does not make everyone a diamond. One person is a sapphire, another an emerald, and so on. And what makes a jewel bright is the fact that it's translucent. It has color, but light can pass through it. And so the light that reaches the eyes of the beholder is transmitted light rather than reflected light. So light thus transfigures the stone, mingles with it, and comes to us in this what's called a synergized state. The light comes to us, which is a mixture of the stone and the pure white light. So when we meet a saint, we're meeting God as it were mingled with that unique person. So one saint whom I knew a little was called Father Sophroni. He was a Russian um, and founded a monastery in Essex in England. So he was a Russian monk who in 1955 moved to Essex to found a monastery there. You can visit it still in Tolleson Nights. 
He had been an artist before becoming a monk on Mount Athos in Greece, having studied art in Russia and then in Paris in the 1920s. On Athos, he first lived in a large monastery of a few thousand monks under the guidance of another saint called Saint Silvan, who himself was a Russian peasant, his father Sophronia was more of an aristocratic background. Again, you can see there the uniqueness of each of those two saints. On Father Silvan's death, Saint Sophronia moved to live in a cave on Mount Athos. And in due course, we think because of illness, he had to go to Paris for an operation. I mean, in 1955, he moved to Essex to found the monastery which still flourishes. So Father Sophroni was a cultured man, somewhat otherworldly and quite a majestic personality. In contrast to this, there was another saint whom I knew on Mount Athos. His name was Paisius, Father Paisius. So Father Paisius, when I knew him, lived in a hut in Mount Athos. And he was very approachable. He had a wonderful sense of humour and used wonderful imaginative images to explain spiritual things. This is Father Sophroni, and this is Father Paisius. So Father Paisius was of a very different character from Father Sophroni, but both were jewels shining brightly, each with its own colour as it were. And then there's Father Vesilius. Uh, he now lives as a hermit, but he, when I knew him, was abbot of the monastery of Averon, where I lived for two years, before living as a hermit for six years in the hills of Shropshire. So I had the blessing of working very closely with Father Vesilius for almost two years as the monastery iconographer. For Father Vesilius, freedom was very important, especially freedom from the smallness of the human mind cut off from God. And all those who meditate, I think aim to descend into the heart. So you all know, I think, what I'm talking about. A small mind attempts to bottle divine mystery into mental concepts. And I found that I would sometimes ask Father Vesalius a question about some spiritual matter, but often his answers would appear not at all to be related to what I had asked. But only later would I realize that his reply had in fact addressed the deeper question behind my question. He had addressed the searching of my soul and not just the petty curiosity of my brain. And most importantly, his answer, sometimes cryptic, changed the way that I saw things. And it was this change itself that gave the answer to my question. You recall that I said repentance in Greek can be translated as a change of a way of seeing. Another way to explain this transformation that I found in talking with him was that I was attracted not so much to change the way that I saw the world, but what I looked at it with, the organ of my perception, as it were. By that, I mean that Father Vesalius helped me to look with the eye of the noose or of the heart and not just with the eye of the brain. Uh, our mental faculty is, of course, a wonderful God-given gift, and I do not want to denigrate it, but it has its limitations. By itself, the mental or rational faculty cannot comprehend the high things of God. For this, the eye of the heart is needed, the noose illuminated by the Holy Spirit. The rational faculty can know about things, whereas the noose knows things as they are, knows them from the inside out, as it were. So the spiritual heart is the captain of the person, while the rational faculty can be seen as the steering wheel that is used to guide the body of the ship. And I come to see that it is this noetic way of life that was common to all the saints I've known. This saint, Saint Porphyrius, I met briefly living in Athens. And he's a graphic example of someone who lived a supernatural life in a very natural way. He was near his death when I saw him and he was actually blind. However, he could see things that no mere human can see with their physical eyes. He'd spent most of his life in the center of Athens as chaplain to one of the busiest hospitals there. So he wasn't someone who lived in a cave, though he started his life on Mount Athos. As those who have visited it 
No, Athens is not the most beautiful of cities, full of concrete and noise and smell. And yet, Father Porfirio spread beauty to all those whom he encountered because he himself was beautiful. He himself lived in the spirit. He was granted to see and know things that no mere man could know. For example, and these are true stories I heard from the people themselves often, one of the spiritual children living in Australia rang Father Porfirio's up to ask his advice what to do with some property he had just brought, bought. St. Porfirius described the property to him with great accuracy, suggesting what he could build and where, as though he himself were there. He had this gift of even seeing below the earth that people were looking for water. But all this wasn't scary. It wasn't to draw attention to himself. It was the natural result given by God to him of him living in the spirit. So it's people like Father Sophroni, Pisius, Basilius and Porphyrius, whom an icon painter is trying to paint. So what is an icon? The word icon is Greek for image. But you and I are icons made in God's image. But the icons that I paint or carve are man-made images of saints or sacred events. But they're much more than mere pictures, like a photograph or books for the literate, as some people have described icons. Icons are doors through which we can pass to meet those who are depicted thereon, be it Christ, the mother of God, the angels, or the saints. This is the um, chapel of a hermitage where I lived as a hermit for six years. It was an old barn which I restored and frescoed and painted the icons for. So when you enter an Orthodox church, especially one covered in frescoes or mosaics like this, you are aware that you're entering the whole commonwealth of heaven, the city of God, the new Jerusalem. There's no death or separation, for you are surrounded by all those who once walked upon earth, but are now here present with you in the spirit. They are present for they are in Christ, and you also are in Christ. You are members of the single body of the church. In fact, the whole church building, when fully decorated with frescoes or mosaics like this, is itself an icon of paradise. There, when you enter church, you are in intimate communion with God, along with all the saints around us, who are like trees in paradise. The stars and the heavens are also present. As I said, I lived for six years as a hermit in the hills of Shropshire. But before that, I was trained on Mount Athos, it varied on with Father Vesilius as abbot. In Mount Athos, we would spend at least five hours a day in church services, but often there were also all-night vigils that might start at 10 at night and finish at six in the morning. Now, at key points, at high points during these night vigils, the beeswax candles from the great chandeliers would be lit, and then the chandeliers would be swung and each of the different type of chandelier would have a different rhythm of swinging. So as these lights danced in the darkness, and there are no electrical lights, as these lights danced in the darkness while the monks chanted, he felt that the heavens themselves were obeying the psalmist call. Praise them, sun and moon, the psalmist writes. Praise them, all you shining stars. Praise in your highest heaven. So you found that even inanimate creation is joining in with us humans and praising the creator of all beauty. But darkness is what well is light as a friend of the ascetic who seeks God. In my chapel, this one you can see here at my Shropshire Hermitage, there was no artificial electric light. In this photograph, it's daytime, so lots of light is coming in, but most of the services were held at night, so it was normally much darker. In a dark church with only the pinpoint flames of oil lamps hanging in front of the icons, reflecting off the icon's gold leaf and dimly illuminating the saints who are frescoed on the surrounding walls, you feel that light comes from within the saints and not from without, but the spirit of God dwelling in the saints and moving around them like water for a fish is the light itself. Christ is the light. We draw near to Christmas now, of course, to the nativity of the Son of God, who is the second person of the Holy Trinity, 
who became what we are so that we can become what he is. It's a very bold statement made by some of the early church fathers that God became man, became human, so that we humans by grace can become God. So I thought, because we're coming up to the uh, nativity, that I'd show you one or two things about this nativity icon that I painted. And we'll see how this icon shows how Christ has drawn all things back into unity. It's interesting that the word diabolical means in Greek literally to throw apart. Dia means apart, bolos means to throw. While the word symbol means the opposite. It means to throw together, sim, bolos. So in this sense, the icon is symbolic, for it shows the world thrown back or drawn back into unity by and in Christ. And this is very much the case of the nativity icon here. So in this particular icon of the nativity, the subjects are arranged in three tiers or rows. In the upper, upper third, we find heavenly beings, the angels and the star. In the bottom third, we find the earthly things. There's Joseph on the bottom left, doubting the virgin birth, and on the right, the baby Jesus being washed, and only a body, a human body, can be washed. In the middle third, in the middle tier, we find the union of opposites. So on the left, on the right, sorry, we have the Jewish, poor, and unlearned shepherds. The band gathered around Christ with the Magi on the other side, who are Gentiles, they're rich, and they're learned. Yet these opposites come together in Christ. And just behind the baby Christ is the ox and the ass. Now they are dumb, they can't speak, but they are glad gathered close around the incarnate word of God. And the baby himself, whilst he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and bound and seemingly inactive, remains the creator and sustainer of the universe. So you can see that all opposites are drawn together, heaven and earth, the rich and the poor, learned and unlearned, creator and creation. But there's another shape in this. There's a circle with Christ, Christ's head in the middle. So all the participants are arranged within a circle that is centered on this helpless little child. For while he is a child, he also remains the word of God who, as the Apostle John writes, he was in the beginning and was with God and was God, and through him all things were made. We could also add through him all things continue to exist. So each thing is created by a word spoken by the word himself. And now he has come to earth to draw his fragmented, fragmented world back into beauty. Each person and thing is a musical instrument, but the world is no longer in harmony. I think our ecological crisis is testimony that we are like instrumentalists in an orchestra doing our own thing rather than following the conductor and thus turning the symphony into a cacophony. So what happens? The composer himself, God, himself becomes a player in the orchestra and begins to guide it back into harmony. But like a tuning fork or a metronome, like the mythological Orpheus, the word has come to tame the wildness of the beasts with the beauty of his lyre, with the beauty of his music. So by living and dying and rising from the dead with beauty, Christ has prepared the way for the, for the discordant world to become concordant. The word art means to fitly join together as artist in Latin. Someone's just ringing the doorbell. I've got to get them out. I'll be back in a second. Let's make it. So I have to let my students in. But apart from the icon in itself, the process of making an icon is itself an act which part, in which parts are fitly joined back together, as we recall the word art means to fitly join together. So the raw materials of pigment, wood and egg, of which the icon is made, 
and gather together into something hopefully more beautiful than their constituent parts. So the pigment comes from the mineral kingdom. This is azurite here. The icon is painted on a wooden panel representing the whole vegetable kingdom. And the egg is used to bind the pigment together. This comes from the animal kingdom. So the iconographer, like a priest or a king of the created well, realm, draws these good things together into something that's very good. So he or she makes a material offering or prayer and paint. So this mere object, the icon of material stuff, mere matter, becomes a means of people's communion with God. So matter and spirit are united. The making of an icon is therefore an example of what I might call holy ecology. For we neither leave the raw materials untouched, nor do we debase them. But like a poet who takes words from, from a dictionary and crafts a poem, the icon painter gathers the elements together, discerns the individual character, different pigments have different personalities as it were, and he raises them to a yet higher plane in the service of God and beauty. He takes these raw materials and, as it were, weaves them into a garment for Christ. And these are transfigured together with Christ, as we see in this icon of the Transfiguration. I think it's important that in the Bible it says that not only did Christ's face shine with light when he was transfigured before Peter, James and John, but also his garments, which were just made of linen probably, they too shone with his light. And this light was the grace of God, the glory of God. It was uncreated light, it was divine light. Icon painters don't normally sign their work. The iconographers are of themselves unimportant. The iconographer is there to serve others, so ego has no place at all. The way an icon is painted, the style of it, if you like, helps the viewer, the praying viewer, to turn from a worldview centered on themselves to a worldview centered on God. And this is one reason why the lines of perspective are usually the opposite to what we are acquainted with, say in Renaissance icons. So instead of lines converging onto a point in the distance, like a photograph of a railway line, you, the viewer, become the point at which the lines converge. So the icon, in fact, shows us being contemplated by God we are the vanishing point from God's point of view. So in this way, the very way an icon is painted helps repentance. It turns us from us being the center to God contemplating us. So in a sense, we, we are the center now, but because God is looking at us rather than we being the prime actors looking, God contemplates us. The worst thing for an Israelite was to feel that God had ceased to look upon him or her. The greatest blessing was for God to turn his face towards him and look upon him. In the book of Numbers that is written, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and gives you peace. And this explains why icons really show people on profile, let alone turning away from us. Icons depict the world in relationship. I'd like to um, finish with a lovely um, blessing by uh, a saint called Barsanufius to his spiritual children. And the heart of this, really, uh, why I'm reading is to show that I think meditation is first of all to sit and allow ourselves to be, looked, to be looked at by God, to dwell in the light of his countenance. So we might start as the active ones in meditation, as though we are the ones looking. But the aim of this <clears throat> is to be still and know that God is looking at us. Before reading the blessing of Barsanufius, I'll describe to you an experience I had in that little chapel of which you saw a photograph. <clears throat> One early morning, I was sitting in my dark chapel in the early hours of the morning, praying the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. And then the Lord came to me, not in a vision or anything like that, but I just knew that he was present. Or rather, to put it more accurately, 
somehow I stepped aside or was moved aside so that only I felt God's presence, not my own. So I could see him as he always was. So that moment, it seemed to myself that I'd ceased to exist and that only God was. It was as though I had disappeared and it was only he who remained. I was looking, but was so taken out of myself at this beauty that I saw in my heart that I lost all sense of myself. But then at the same instant, I saw that to see him, I had to exist in the first place. And at that moment, I saw what it was to be human. To be human is to behold the beauty of the Lord, whether it be in one's own heart or through other people or in the rest of creation, a tree or a rock. So to be human is to become all face, all eye. So I'll read out this blessing now of Saint Asenufius. May the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the blessed God of Most High, empower you and strengthen you for the receiving of the Holy Spirit, that he may come and by his good presence teach you about all things and enlighten your hearts and guide you into all truth. And may, I, and, and may I see you flourishing as palm trees in the paradise of my Father and God. May we be found as a fruit-laden olive tree in the midst of the saints, and as a fruitful vine in the divine place, all true. And may the Lord count us worthy of the well of wisdom. For already as many as have drunk the wealth have forgotten themselves, becoming all outside the old man, and from the well of wisdom, they have been guided to another well of love which never fails. And coming to this rank, they have attained the unwandering measure, becoming all mind, all eye, all living, all light, all perfect, all gods. They have toiled, they have been magnified, they have been glorified. They have been clarified. They have lived since they first died. They are gladdened and make glad. They are gladdened in the indivisible trinity and make glad the heavenly powers. Desire their rank, run their race, be zealous for their faith, obtain their humility, their endurance in all things, that you may win their inheritance. Hold to the love which fails not, that you may be found with them in the good things that none can utter or describe, where eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man, but God has prepared for those who love him. Amen.